Good. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Captain Matt Trombley, Third Alarm Charters and Guide Service. I'm over across the border in good old Lake Champlain. I've um, been invited by the folks here at Fish Trail 7 to talk about jigging for lake trout. I do a, a bunch of different seminars and um, shows throughout the winter time, and I've got a couple of different presentations that we do based around the things that I offer. Um, but the tactics and stuff we're going to talk about tonight when it comes to jigging for lake trout, you can use pretty much any body of water. So, you know, you'll see a lot of different things that we do on Champlain, but you can adapt it depending on your bait and your uh, uh, fish in your local waters. You know, it's just using your electronics and knowing your body of water and what you're going to work on. See if my PowerPoint's going to cooperate here tonight. Come on. There we go. So a little bit about myself. I was a career firefighter in the city of Burlington, Vermont for 24 years, retired three years ago in December, actually. And pretty lucky to travel around the country on uh, different trips and stuff. I, I'm a hunter and fisherman. Hunting is my passion and I don't do any guiding there. Most of my business is built around my fishing business. And um, I had a sister business prior to this that I did uh, a consulting agency. I booked trips for outfitters all over the US and Canada and had a chance to hunt in a bunch of different places. This is a drop camp hunt we did out in Idaho back in 2014. So now I'm a full-time guide and uh, charter captain. <clears throat> we run trips virtually from March right into November. November, December is sacred time for me, and I'll be in a tree stand or up on the mountain somewhere. So I don't do any guiding that time of year. But when it comes to fishing, I start in spring out on the Salmon River doing steelhead trips. And then um, we do a lot of spring and fall bass and pike trips um, throughout the bodies of water in Vermont. I run two different vessels. We do uh, a mixed bag of stuff. My spring and fall stuff is mainly, as you'll see on my other boat right now, we are shifting gears and waning off from our spring bass and pike trips and moving into trolling. And this is my main trolling boat. It's a 27 and a half foot Baja cruiser. And we take groups of four to six people out trolling for trout and salmon on that. And my other vessel, which we're going to talk about tonight, we do our spring bass and uh, pike on, but we also do our vertical jigging trips out on this boat. So 2,000, 21 foot one fisherman, and great boat for just about any body of water around here. I do my spring trolling for brown trout on Lake Ontario with it as well. Um, you know, it's good for groups of two or three people with jigging. I can take up to four on it, uh, but it's a very stable vessel and can handle just about everything we throw at it. So tonight we're going to, again, talk a little bit about thinking about your local fishery and, you know, starting off from what I do and what I've adapted to good old Lake Champlain and a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight you can use in any body of water. So with my business, as I said, we start in the springtime doing both trolling and casting trips and then we go into trolling for trout and salmon. As we get deeper into the summer, our lake uh, landlocked salmon fishing for trolling usually tends to wane off and then we'll switch into jigging for vertical acres and then in the fall, I go back to Bass and Pike. So this is the stuff that I concentrate on on Lake Champlain. And just a little bit about our lake for most that know it probably here in the Northeast, but 127 miles of water from Whitehall, the Canadian border. And a mixed smorgasbord of just about everything under the sun that you can target from warm and cold water species. And I am based out of Virgins uh, as far as my trolling charters go. I uh, work out of a marina on the Otter Creek on the Vermont side. But with my jigging, the boat's on a trailer, and I virtually um, work this section here. Converse Bay is right there, and we either launch out of there or Shelburne Bay. So this regional lake is where I do all of my jigging. And you'll learn when I talk about structure and, and using it for Lake George or the Finger Lakes or even any of the lakes up here in the Dax, knowing your time of year and where you expect those trout to be congregated is pretty key in being able to put the tactics together to make it work. Come on. So again, you know, knowing where your fish want to be and the bait that they're looking to eat and the temperatures where they're comfortable dictates where they go. And why am I talking about this? Well, a lot of people ask, can you jig for lake trout virtually year round? Of course you can. Their biggest densities tend to be once the thermocline establishes. And we're just about to that point. Of course, we've had five days of good old Northwest wind, but 
once that lake starts to set up, you start looking at thermocline. The thermocline is going to usually be 35 to 45, 50 feet down. Once that establishes that warm water on top, you're looking at that layering. That's what's going to slide those lake trout to start to condense onto deeper water structure. Right now, you can catch them you know, scattered out just about anywhere mixed in with other species. And I've noticed just in the last week, we're starting to see that wane off. The Lakers are definitely starting to head deeper. So you keep all that knowledge together and start thinking about where am I going to find those fish as, as the season wears on. In the springtime, your, your Lakers are going to be spread out much more vast sections of water from 25 to 40 feet deep. So you're going to spend a lot of time in your vessel looking around on your fish finder trying to find them. As we get closer to the thermocline, they're going to start to condense in 65, 75 foot of water. You go into the density of summer, virtually from July 1st into middle of September, and you're going to find them from 85 to 100 foot. <laughs> Again, I'm going off from my lake, but thinking about what you know from your local body of water. In Champlain, our fishery was primarily a smelt fishery uh, until the alewives arrived, and they showed up uh, probably pushing 25 years ago now. And those fish have adapted greatly. Fish and wildlife was greatly concerned when the alewives showed up, no different than when they showed up in the Great Lakes. They've been in the Lake Ontario system for 45, 50 years now. They have an issue with thiamine problem when it comes to the egg rearing when we talk about salmon species. Doesn't seem to affect the lake trout um, or most any of the trout species for that matter. And if anything, they're a higher protein fish and our fish are putting on weight because of the alewives. So the problem with alewives, <clears throat> they're very prone to die offs from cold shock and they don't adapt well in the winter time um, to fluctuating water temperatures. And Lake Champlain, I'll back up a few slides. The Inland Sea is virtually this region up here, which this past winter is really about all that froze in from Crown Point South froze in in this section up here. And if anybody kept track of the news, sadly, we lost four different fishermen in this stretch um, of the lake last this past winter on ice fishing. But because of the crazy winter with warms and colds, we saw a lot of winter die off of alewives in this area here. The beaches had a lot of them on it this spring. And they're very notorious for doing that. Um, the main lake we didn't see anywhere, so it didn't freeze. Those fish just adapted to that. Um, and smelt have never had an issue with it, but the alewives certainly do. So they move around. You'll see some sections of the lake will, won't be affected. In other places in the springtime, you'll see, you'll see a, a quite a bit of them you know, dead on the shoreline. Back to where we were. So tonight's you know, discussion is going to be about how do we target these fish in the summertime and start using different tactics to, to target them. Um, first and foremost is, is starting with your vessel. Before we get into thinking about the, the uh, presentation as far as rod, reel, lures, etc., knowing the body of water that you're going to, having good mapping, and most importantly, understanding your electronics. Um, the first thing that I do is, is uh, looking at my mapping system I'm a hummingbird guy, so I like Lake Master. I used to be uh, very in tune to Navionics, and as time has gone on, it seems to be that Lake Master has a little bit better structure or detail than Navionics does. They go back and forth all the time. But with today's electronics, you can get downloads for your phone or your tablet and being able to zoom right in to specific structure. And understanding what you're reading on your sonar is pretty critical to being able to see just what's going to be going on with these fish. One of the first things I do is go out in the morning when I head out on our jigging trips and I'll come into a specific piece of structure. Turn on my regular 2D um, fish finder. You don't need structure scan. And again, in the summertime, I usually do most of my jigging trips in July and August. So when I'm looking at the machine, I'm not looking in 25 foot of water. I'm looking at 85 to 110. And I'm looking to just see if I see marks down there. And if I see marks, then I'll zoom. I'll take the bottom 10 or 15 feet, then I'll zoom down there and try and see if those fish are tucked right in the mud or if they're up a little bit. So if I'm seeing some marks, I'm going to turn around the next key piece for my boat. And when it comes to using today's technology, years ago, the few people that actually jigged for lake trout just drifted. They put a drift sock out or went with the wind. Today, having uh, an electronic uh, bow mount trolling motor with spot lock on it is is almost imperative. 
Um, the spot lock technology, which just about everybody's got out to now, uh, today. Minn Kota came out with it six or seven years ago. And it's it takes a GPS coordinate of your location, turns the motor on, and it spins you into your wind direction, and it'll hold you right there. Now, the whole challenge with that is, number one, how rough the water going to be. And usually in two footers and more, you're going to have a struggle just standing up the boat and trying to jig. But more importantly, how long is your battery life going to be because that motor is running nonstop? You know, on a nice calm day, it may turn on once every 30 seconds just to keep you on position. But the heavier wind you got, the more that motor is just running nonstop trying to keep you on that position. So I run a 36 volt system um, on my bow mount trolling motor on the Big Lund. About a six hour trip on a windy day is all she's good for. If that motor is running nonstop trying to keep me on position. On a lighter day, I can go six to 10 hours with no problem. So once I find that structure and knowing that I'm seeing fish there, then we're gonna make a decision whether we're gonna drop on it, put some lures down there and see if the, what the fish's mood are. Um, every day is different. And, you know, I get asked constantly, you know, what's the best time? First thing in the morning? Well, sure, low light, I don't care what type of species you're targeting, especially when it comes to trout and salmon, low light is definitely better. But in my business, getting folks to come to the dock at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning is not the easiest thing to do. So virtually my trips are meet at the dock at 5.30 and we're on the water by 6 o'clock. You are missing a little bit of that bite. I've had some absolutely stellar evenings out jigging. And I don't do a lot of afternoon trips. If I'm feeling real brave and want to do doubles, I'll take two trips a day. And, you know, we do have some afternoon trips. Many times just me and friends that have gone out. But that 5 to 7 o'clock when that sun gets out of 45, and I also fish Lake Ontario, and it seems like kings do the exact same thing. When that sun gets to like a 45 degree angle, man, the bite can just be stupid. And these guys will just go nuts. And that lasts, you know, before it gets to sunset. Usually after sunset, forget it. But from 5 to 7 o'clock, you know, I'll say 6 to 7, really, when we start seeing that 45 degree angle later in the summer of that sun, the bite can be a lot of fun. So, um, you know, again, every fishery is a little bit different. When we start talking about the baits we're going to present, thinking about your jigging action, different things to do going to have a lot to do with the fish that you're presenting and i'll back up one slide tim moore um, is a guide on out on uh lake winnipesaukee in new hampshire he also has a youtube channel and a local tv show and he came up and filmed with me and this was going probably six years ago now and that's his cameraman with me and they're used to fishing lake winnipesaukee where they're catching two to four pound lake trout on a regular basis probably not a lot different than a lot of the small lakes up in the dax so they're using a lot smaller baits. They're using medium to medium light rods. And most of the time using an ounce of three quarter ounce jig with you know maybe a three inch bait. That's baby food for Champlain. You know, I'm running, as you're gonna see, a lot bigger stuff most of the time. When they're finicky, we'll switch it up. So again, every day is different. If I'm headed out with a crew of four, probably all four people are gonna have different lures in their rods. And I'm gonna see who's getting bit. We keep switching over and let the fish tell you, as with any type of fishing, let the fish tell you what they want to run. So when Tim came up, he had never fished Champlain. Now he comes up every, every year, either brings his kayaks or his own boat and just comes up to Champlain to fish for fun with his buddies. And as I said, he's a New Hampshire guide, so he does stuff over there. But um, he was grins all day long. We probably did 12 or 15 Lakers that, that day. Um, and every one of them were bigger than any Laker he'd ever caught in his life. So, you know, we're not going to see 30 pounders, but we do a fair amount of those 8 to 12s and I'll usually get one that'll break 15 every summer. So, you know, we've, we've got some pretty decent for the Northeast when it comes to pounds outside of Lake Ontario, obviously. So thinking about what's the main bait for your body of water. And tonight I'm going to try and steer our program around understanding different bodies of water and just adapting the tools that you have. Um, you can, as I said, you can jig in Lake Winnipesaukee, you can jig up in Sebago in Maine, you can jig in the Finger Lakes. I've got buddies that jig for them when we've had ice in the wintertime. It's just thinking about where your fish located and adapting um, to the bait presentation you would expect and the size. So as we go deeper in the summer, our air wives are going a little bit bigger, the fish are going deeper, they need a bigger profile, we're throwing a bigger bait to them, it's all. In the springtime, you're probably throwing something a little lighter, they're in shallower. You know, Lakers are, a lot like northern pike that they're opportunists they're not picky they're going to eat just about anything they can get 
Um, everything from emeralds to smell alewives, white suckers, perch, I've seen it all in their stomachs. Um, I've, one of the other problems that we're finding is I dress probably a dozen lakers a year that are full of soft plastics. They, in the springtime, will come into the shallows where guys are bass fishing and they're sucking up soft plastics that are left from bass fishermen. So one of the things, my little PR thing is tell everybody who's a bass guy out there, please put your soft plastics when you break one off or one's getting done. Put it in the bag in the boat and don't chuck it overboard because the Lakers gobble them up and they do not digest them. Actually, we got a lake trout on a small lake in Vermont um, this past winter. As soon as my son landed him ice fishing, she was skinny as a rail. I said, guarantee she's got soft plastic. Her stomach was loaded with them. She couldn't digest any food. She was skinnier than a rail. So, you know, she had been eating all that stuff. So as I've been saying, you know, throughout so far this evening is, you know, in the springtime, right after ice out, people cast from shore. The Burlington break wall on the Vermont side up on Lake Champlain is very popular. Guys would go up and years ago, they would chuck out sown smelt. But today, just throwing big spoons right from shore, and you got a shot at catching them. I've even got a buddy that's a fly guy, and he's been targeting lake trout in April with a fly rod. So <clears throat> they're, in, they're in the shallows. They're cruising around looking for food. And as we get deeper into spring towards summertime, they're going to steadily slide into the deeper water and, and looking not only for comfortability, but food as well. So in the summertime, where I tend to have the best luck, and again, I do it because it coincides with how my business goes. As my trolling is slowing down, um, and I'm going to a more of a bottom program to target lake trout just to fire rods or salmon fishing pretty well non-existent by mid-July. So we can offer jigging as well as trolling to whatever our customers want to do to suit their needs. I'm going to go out looking for a structure that's close to deep water that starts in 85, sometimes 100, 110. For my lake, I have found 85 to 90, 95 tends to be where they want to be. The deeper you go into the summertime, you're also getting closer to their spawn time. They spawn in the fall. So those fish really start to condense in bigger schools where they're going to be starting to think about sliding into the, you know, shallow areas. Um, and one of the things that if any of you follow local news here in the Northeast, um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife has been working with the University of Vermont and doing a lot of studies in Lake Champlain in the last five years. They have found that since 2014, we've had an immense amount of natural reproduction going on. No different than the studies they've done on Kings and Lake Ontario. The challenge is how much do we stock versus the prey body we have in our lake. We don't want to overstock Kings in Ontario. We don't want to overstock Lakers in Champlain and eat themselves out of house and home. And I would say probably 25 to 30 percent of my Lakers each year are natural reproduction fish now. You can tell them instantly they're more brilliant colored, number one. Most importantly, they don't have a fin clip. They've got all their natural fins. And when you look on their fins, they've got really nice, brilliant red and orange tips on the tips. So you can tell that they're natural versus the more dull looking um, uh, stock fish, even if they didn't have a fin clip. So that's an encouraging thing, knowing we've got natural reproduction, natural spawn going on in the lake. And those fish have got just certain areas. They've done tagging of the Lakers and Lake Champlain and really knowing where their predominant areas are that they're doing their spawning versus where they travel in other parts of the year. So in late September through October is where their, their spawn time is. <clears throat> and, you know, they know those gravel bars and places where they believe that they're going to go in and be laying their eggs. So following them and thinking about where they're going to be throughout the season is, you know, a big deal in knowing where you're going to have decent numbers of fish that you can target and have success in trying to hook up on it. As I keep blabbering, guys, any questions so far? I'm going to break into more of the how-to meat and potatoes of what I do for jigging. So when we start thinking about, okay, I've got a boat. I've got electronics. I can go out and look at structure. I've got my mapping system. What am I going to throw down there? Well, uh, first off is thinking about the tackle you need. And you can't use, you know, a, a deep sea fishing rod. And I get people, oh, well, we jig for cod out in the ocean. Will that work? No, probably not. You know, not talking 50 pound test here with, you know, a rod that's big around your wrist. But in the same token, you're not going to have much luck with your six pound crappie rod either. So, so what I tend to like and what I have kind of dialed in, and again, from a guide perspective, spinning rods are the best. Um, I get a lot of folks that bring bait casting with them if they're going to bass fish. And I got plenty of buddies that are uh, jigging for lake trout with, with bait casters. But um, because, number one, 
we are targeting some fish. They got a little bit bigger shoulders than most other species. You need a little backbone. But number two, you're getting those fish to chase from the bottom. And we're going to talk about the, the tactic portion of it a little bit later on. I like a seven foot medium to medium heavy one piece um, spinning rod. I want something that's got a nice, good, strong spine. You don't need a lot of action. As you see, this is a pretty stiff tip. Uh, I just started using cash hand rods. I met them at a show down in Mass this winter. Not only the US made, but they had a lot of different models for drop shotting for smallies from to casting big jigs for large mouse. And I told the guy, I said, I need something that I can jig for Lakers using, you know, baits that are three quarters to two ounces. And he goes, here, try this out. And it, and it balanced really well. Um, you know, a 2,500 or 3,000 series spinning rod or reel. But again, I'm not looking to be able to hop a Ned rig that weighs a quarter ounce there, an eighth of an ounce down there. I need something that's, that's pretty stiff. So this particular jig I just had laying around. I'm not going to tell you it's my top one or my worst one. Um, but, the, you know, you can see the size of bait. That's a uh, one and three quarter ounce pro jig head with a pretty big paddle tail on it. And most of our hits come on the chase coming up. And it's, just, it's not to say that we don't get them jigging off the bottom. It really depends on what the bite is. Um, but 95% of our hits come when you start reeling back up to the top. And you can literally watch the fish finder and see the jig coming up. And then all of a sudden you see a fish starting to streak up behind them. Some of them will hit 10 foot off the bottom. Others will hit 15 foot from the surface. You know, they'll just keep climbing and following that bait. So, you know, again, thinking about how deep you are in... This poor jig has obviously caught some fish and a lot, a lot of bucktail left on it. But, you know, I just keep switching that paddle tail. The paddle tail has got a lot of vibration. This is one that a, a guy in Vermont actually poured for me. It's got some glow in it. Um, and I'm, you're going to see I've got a multitude of different style of jigs and things that I try from day to day. Um, the day I took Tim Moore out, I'm throwing these. I'm getting like one bite to every five of his. And he was throwing a smaller diamond jig that day. And they wanted a more subtle bite. High sun, flat calm, I was a surprise. Um, but I had a day summer before last, your atypical midsummer, rainy, drizzly, not a puff of wind, but it just kind of showered all day long. And the bite was probably one of the best I've ever seen. I took three different pictures during the day with a crew of four that all four guys were locked up on Lake Trout at the same time. Every rod was bent over and they're all cranking up fish. So, you know, we probably netted over 40 Lakers that day. And every guy I talked to on the lake said the same thing. They're like, man, the plate was just stupid today. And it was just, you know, that we happened to hit that barometer just right. Um, and we had cloud cover all day long, so they were on the feed. But it didn't really matter what you threw down there. You know, they were, they were gonna chase it, and if they saw it, then they were gonna hop on it. In transverse of that, I had another day where I had a, a gent and his son and his two grandsons. The grandsons were probably preteen. And they were really struggling. And Grampy's hooking up about every third drop. And he wasn't landing them all, but he, he was feeling it. And so I just kind of watched him and watched what he was doing. Not only was he hopping the bottom a little bit, but he was reeling it up pretty doggone slow. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm perch jigging. I said, okay, describe to your kid, your grandkids, what do you mean by perch jigging? Well, he says, I'm just doing what I would if I was ice fishing in 15 foot of water. I'm just dropping it down a... I'm just hopping it a couple of times and I just start cranking real slow. Those fish were sluggish that day and they weren't chasing aggressive, but they'd see that lure just kind of doing this down there and then slowly taking off. And that's what they wanted for the bite that day. So, you know, you just keep switching it up and trying different things. Um, as far as line, you'll see I got 20 pound uh, uh, braid on there. And I like braid, again, thinking about your hook sets. Um, you're dropping baits down. 85 to 100 foot deep, you're not going to want to use mono. You got to have something that you're going to drill them home pretty quick. I do 99% catch and release. There is tons of late trout, late champlain. There's absolutely no problem with keeping some fish. But most of my tourism based folks aren't looking to go home with a cooler full of fish and transverse when I go out to Lake Ontario. Everyone wants to fill coolers. So, you know, being we're doing a lot of catch and release, a single hook is a lot better for the fish. And you're going to see I've got baits that got trebles on them too. I've switched the majority of my jigs to single hooks just because they're easy to release and not as much harm to the fish, but you're going to drop some fish too. One of the places that most people struggle, the sneeze coming on, my allergies have been killing me lately. Apologize. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
one of the places that most all my clients struggle with, people get a bite and they think from a bass fishing perspective, they're trying to do the, the pump and crank thing. If you give these guys, especially with a single hook, a split section, second of slack, they're gonna drop the lure, they're gone. So one of the things that I've found is I keep that rod locked right in my hand. When I feel a fish bite, I pull up a little bit, I crank on them, and I keep my body in this motion right here. I don't pump up and down with my arms. I pull up and as I'm bending over my body, I crank on the downstroke. And I want rod bend, and I mean loads, to the point that rod tip is touching the water all the time on that fish. And it, a lot of people, it takes some time to really grasp that whole theory. Because they're like, oh, they got a fish on for 10 seconds and they're gone. And I watch them do a pump up and you watch that rod just kind of goes flex for a split second. And that split second is slack in the line. And with a single hook lure, it's imperative to keep that hook driven home. With these guys jigging, nine times out of 10, they're climbing and chasing, and they're either nipping at the tail. And we've tried, and first thing people ask, well, put a stinger hook on there. I've tried it. Problem with the stinger is you lose action. So the action's what kicks, what makes them chase. <coughs> so you either feel them on for a split second, they're gone, and the lure comes up with the tail bit off. No surprise there. But the other thing is they just nip at it, and they're probably just getting the tip of the snout. Um, and really getting that hook driven home on that first hit and keeping them locked up is, is, is imperative. So as I said, I run pretty much braided line in a fluorocarbon leader of 12 to 17 pounds. And these guys aren't line shy. Again, you're dropping a lure down 100 foot deep. I go with pretty heavy. Most of the time I'm running 17, maybe even 20 pound fluorocarbon. You're not worrying about jig action like you are with a Ned Rig for smallies. So it's not that big a deal and you want to keep them loaded up. But again, if you were fishing up here in the Dax in a smaller body of water, you might want to stay with like a 12 pound fluorocarbon, just something a little lighter, a little uh, better lure action and, and not uh, gonna have a problem with spooking fish. The baits, <laughs> some days they want one thing, another day you can drop anything in their face and they're gonna thump on it. I again, it's no different than any other type of fishing out there, but to just keep trying with them. And I'm gonna throw a bunch of different slides up about what I'm using. The good old bucktail, and again, for me, I have found to probably one of my top producers, and I'm gonna talk about two different types of bucktails that we use. <laughs> but on some days, they are finicky. And I had, I lived last, just last summer, a perfect example, happened to be a day that Tim Moore had come over from Vermont. He was asking for a little intel, told him where I was catching fish. He texted me around 8, 30, 9 o'clock. He goes, how's the bite? And I said, man, I grabbed six in that first hour, and we we're sucking hind tit now. And he says, me too. He says, I can't get anything to fire. We're just, we're struggling. So he actually went to a couple of different spots and he said, wait a minute, I'm going to try really paring things down a little bit. So he went down to a little small half or three quarter ounce jig. And it looked very similar to this one. Something you expect to use for smallmouth bass. Now the problem with using a half or three quarter ounce jig in 85 foot of water, it takes forever for that thing to get down there. And you got to really be on the ball just to know when it's all the way down be able to feel it. But he got it down there, popped it a couple of times, just started bringing it back up. Got thumped. Okay, let's see if we can duplicate that. And he texted me and I was done for the day. I only had one charter that day. This is probably one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, it's stupid. I went down to a small jig and he goes, every drop I'm hooked up now. So he too had been running bigger baits earlier in the day. Finally got dialed in on something that was working for him. <clears throat> so I've brought a multitude of different jigs with me guys. And the good old bucktail is, as I said, probably one of the biggest go-tos for me. You can see I've been using Spro's for a while. Some of these are pretty well torn and tattered. Uh, and I like the Spro because of the hook they use. It's got a lot of meat. It's got a nice uh, big old sharp hook bend in it. it white or white and chartreuse are, are probably two of our best go-tos. Um, I will say I've had some luck. I've got a good friend. His name's Mike Avila, and he's from Massachusetts. And... He ties a lot of saltwater lures, but he does some freshwater stuff too. He does a ton of jigs, and his, his company's called Born to Fish Lures. As he likes to promote, he's a military guy, and they're made right in the U.S. Um, but he tied some stuff up for me. And as you can again see, white is the main thing, with usually some, some blue, black, or chartreuse. And he's actually tied some up for me with some mylar in them, similar to what we use for trolling flies for Lake Ontario, something that's got some UV you know, reflection down there. 
and I've had really good luck with these. In the last two summers, I've been running his stuff as well mixed in, and we've had good luck. 95% of the time, I'm putting a small paddle tail on there um, of some sort, usually a three or four inch, maybe a five inch, big one like that one, but similar to a Kai Tech, <clears throat> anything that's got you know, a kick to it. White, white and pearl, you know, white with chartreuse. Again, this is a, a Kai Tech, a smaller one, but that's generally what I'm pairing up with that jig and have a pretty good uh, success rate. Sometimes a, a white curly tail grub works. Um, and I'm, I've got some other jigs here that I'm not going to pull out just yet because I'm going to go with a PowerPoint. But again, thinking about what you might have in your tackle box that will work down there for them. As I mentioned, I'm going to have four rods set up virtually every morning and probably going to have two of them with bucktails of some sort. One with what we call a diamond jig or an albie jig. These are saltwater jigs, mainly for bottom ground fish in the ocean. But again, they go down pretty doggone quick and it's just hopping them, seeing what that reaction is. These are more of a sharp jerk and retrieve. These two are blade baits. Um, and steel shad is the one on the left. They've got a very light metal blade to them and with a, a lead that's melded around the end here. They do a lot of UV imprinting of different color shades. I think when it comes to blade baits, this is my personal preference and why I think they've worked for me. It's vibration and thump that those Lakers want to be able to feel down there. Every fish feels things with their lateral line. And these type here, that's a storm, but I've got a couple other different types of blades. I'm actually a good friend of mine from up in Maine who's got a tackle shop. He did some up for me, uh, one ounces. And uh, again, white with chartreuse or Wonder Bread um, is definitely a top producer. Now you see this one had trebles on it and I took them off and I put a single hook on it. I know I'm going to lose some fish, but it's much easier on the fish as far as releasing them and not having the troubles on there. But you can almost tell when you drop those blade baits down to the bottom, you hop them a couple of times and you feel brr, brr, and that's your rod vibrating when you pull that blade up. I'll hop it a couple of times, stop for a minute, and then I just start cranking it. Number one, you can tell if it's fouled instantly because you better feel that rod tip doing that when you start cranking. You get four revolutions out and it's not doing it, it's tied around. Just crank it up to the surface and get the hook off the line drop it back down again. And that's the problem with the blade baits is they do foul pretty regularly, where very rarely do you find a, a, a bucktail do that. But many times if those fish, and I'm seeing fish on the screen, my customers are getting bit every once in a while, but nobody's locked up yet. I'll drop a blade down and rip it a couple of times and they're hearing that going down. And they'll come over and check it. And I'll start cranking it to the surface and all of a sudden I'm loaded up and they aren't. And they're like, what's the problem? I'm like, they want vibration, so I'll put a couple blade baits on and they'll get bit for a while. The day I had Tim Moore out with me, he was throwing this exact jig right here with no trailer on it. And I'm throwing a big bucktail. And that day, they, he would drop that to the bottom. He lifted up off the bottom probably a foot and a half. He'd twitch it once and then he'd just start reeling. So that thing's you know, doing this. It's a jointed diamond jig. It flopped a couple times and it's got a real subtle, subtle flop to it when you retrieve it. And that's what they wanted that day. So again, <coughs> It's just playing around with them. And these are by Daddy Mac Lures, who I'm a pro staffer for. They're, again, mainly a saltwater company. Um, and Tim actually designed this. It's called the Nervous Minnow. They make a diamond jig or an albie jig, as they call it, using out in the ocean. And it's that exact jig without the joint in it. So Tim said, listen, come up with a way to mold that with a joint in the center. So when you retrieve it, that tail kicks a little bit. And on... When a Pasaki, he has found, he has had better luck with no trailer on it. Some days they want a grub on it for that extra tail action. And I'm, again, I'll just keep trying different stuff down there. And you don't have to have a lot of colors. You're just imitating smelt or gobies or uh, alewives. And the green and silver and blue and silver are the two that usually work the best for us. And these are a three quarter or one ounce. I know they're no heavier than that, but they come with a single hook on them. So again, they're easy on the fish. I've probably got the better part of 200 jigs at home. I just threw this box together. So that is the actual blade right there that's in this photo. <laughs> it's pretty well beat up. It's definitely caught its share of fish, but I've got this one in a fire tiger. So it just goes to show white's not always the top color, but chartreuse, that chartreuse and orange fire tiger, um, has taken a ton of lake trout with it. Well, 
but that's only a three quarter ounce bait. So it's gonna take a while to get it down to the bottom. Once you got slack in your line, you almost know it's there, really just enough so you see your rod load a little bit, you know it's off the bottom. Rip it a couple of times, you're gonna know it's vibrating and uh, get those fish to, to strike on it. So as I said, uh, you know, the Albi jig, um, the Daddy Mac version that Tim came up with, it calls a nervous minnow. It's just, they get down very quick. They drop fast, so you can get down to the bottom. And sometimes, if you've got a bunch of fish working, then sometimes they just want to see something different. If you've been throwing bucktails at them for 10 minutes, and you see them come up on the fish finder, and they're just going back down, they aren't committing. Hook something else on or have somebody else drop something down real quick. And all of a sudden, you'll see that fish dart over because it's something you hadn't seen yet, and they will grab it. You know, I talked a little earlier on about bucktails, and you know, I, I profess to saying that they certainly are my top producer because it's what I've used the most. In the last season, I started going to tubes, and there's a fair amount of companies that are going with bigger tubes. I've been using tubes for smallmouth fishing for years, but now you're finding bigger tubes. And again, every body of water is a bit different. I've done a lot of YouTube studying and up in Canada and in the Midwest, the guys have been using tubes all a ton. But on Champlain, the last couple of seasons, they've really started to come into their own. And I'll be the first to say, this one right here, you can get right outside here at Fish 307. Um, happens to be one of the ones they carry here. Some of them are pre-rigged. This particular one from Mission Tackle has got a stinger built into it. And it's got a regular jig, uh, 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 jig point on it as well. You can rig these on your own. <clears throat> and I've experimented a little bit. And as I said, I troll for salmon out Lake Ontario. And I've taken some of my leftover salmon flies. And I'll put a, a heavy uh, trolling weight down inside here. We'll punch a little hole in the tip of the jig. We'll thread the, the trolling flies that Tom Allen makes, atomic flies out in Lake Ontario. They've got 50-pound fluorocarbon leaders. So I'll punch a hole right in the front of that tube. We'll slide a you know, three-quarter ounce trolling sinker into there. And then I, you know, before I do that, I slide the tail end of that fly so the treble is going to stick out here. And you've got that extra mylar that's got a lot of different shimmering action to it. So the tube is the big, you know, I like glow white. That's obviously one of our top colors. That's the attractor, but they see that mylar UV tinsel that looks more middle like on the tail end of it. And again, they're treble hooks. So you've got a treble sticking out right here. So you can run them a bunch of different ways. The plus with this system here is you're running a tube very similar to what you would for smallies. Your weight is forward with a 90 degree hook. So you can drop that down to the bottom. It's got a natural flip action to it that you can jig it like a regular jig, no different than you are with a bucktail. With this system, you know, your line's going to be going through the center right straight to the surface. So it's literally as soon as it pops and you retrieve it, it's turning and heading right straight back up. So you're counting on just the tail kick to allure those fish to hopefully get them entice them into the bite. When they seem to be finicky here, and I've got some buddies in Champlain, they found in the last summer or two, they're going to more tubes than they are uh, bucktails. I think it's, it's the more subtle multiple tail action of a tube that those Lakers tend to want. So um, it varies from time of the year to those fish that you're targeting. Um, I don't think I brought any tubes with me today on this kit. Pretty much all metal and bucktails. But again, the tubes are definitely coming into their own. And as I said, <laughs> when in doubt, switch it up. Um, you know, any swim bait head from three quarter ounce up to two ounce, I have found the ounce and a half tends to be our best. Um, and I think that having the bucktail definitely gives it a bigger bait profile. And this one, you're kind of hard to see in the picture. It does have some mylar in it that gives it a little extra shimmer and look like oh, a normal bait or a, uh, a bait fish down there. But I, I tend to find that most of our hookups have been coming with that style bait. Some days, just a standard jig head with no bucktail on it at all and, and putting a grub on the back or a uh, paddle tail. I think that swimming action is really what they want and they'll bite. This is a standard Albi jig that I put a soft plastic, a bass plastic on it. And that's a different type of blade bait. It's more of a bass blade bait uh, that's only a half or a three quarter ouncer, but um, again, it's getting that vibration and thump that they wanted uh, and tends to uh, be what that fish want as far as vibration, not so much the chase. One thing about it, when you're used to catching fish 
from a bass perspective that people want a rod in their hand and they don't have the patience to troll and wait for a fish to fire. The jigging is a total different perspective and you're not catching perch. You know, you're getting into some fish that are gonna really load the rod up. They're gonna make some runs. It's a different run. Instead of a fish scurrying off, going side to side like kings do, these guys will come halfway to the surface and go right back to the bottom on you and you're just holding on. For people that have ocean fish, it's not different than jigging for cod or haddock. You're just using lighter tackle, that's all. So these fish will, <laughs> will certainly be more cooperative, but when you start putting the whole program of using your electronics, knowing your structure, seeing those fish come up and watching the hit right in your arm. Um, it's a, a really cool to be able to see what's going on. And you know, today when you start adding in the big money electronics and using live scope or mega 360 and being able to see those fish come from different directions, you can, you know, the sky's the limit how much money you want to spend in, in for electronics. My personal preference is you don't have to have it. I can get fish pretty, pretty well and knowing the particular structure when I see arcs down there. Those are lake trout. Those aren't perch and 100 foot of water on the bottom. Um, occasionally we'll get a ling cod in with them. I think I've got four in the last 10 years. And 95% going to be lake trout that you're getting down there. But this is what you can get. That's 12 pounder there. You know, vast majority of them are going to be these six to 10 pounders. And, you know, you'll get 25 cookie cutter clones that are all the same size, but you can really do up some numbers um, when, you know, the conditions are right but there is a chance for a behemoth. That one was pushing 15. And that was an evening trip. These guys were here for three days with me. They did two mornings in the middle of three days. They said, oh, we're gonna try an afternoon evening. And if anybody knows Lake Champlain, yep, that's the Burlington waterfront in the background. So pretty easy to tell where we are, right in the center of the broad lake. But there is dozens of structures and reefs throughout Lake Champlain that'll hold fish. Um, I will say it's getting more and more popular. There's a lot of people doing it, but Actually, you can learn a little bit about just this photo. I'm using my tablet that day, and I've got my uh, Lake Master maps downloaded on my tablet, and I'm looking at my structure there, and I've got two fish finders, one on each console, my big girl, my 10-incher over here, and I've got a 7-incher here. So I just got a little bit different looks at the bottom and trying to see, you know, what fish are, are actually coming up and chasing. And that evening there was, again, one of those nights that by 7.30, quarter day, the guys were like, okay, our arms are shot. We can head back for dark. If they literally are cranking fish left and right. So that's a little bit about lake trout jigging. And this is my fleet and the equipment that we use. The good old Otter Creek and Lake Champlain. Any questions, guys? What about suspending? Very little. Um, and I'm not going to say that it won't work. I have found because of the two rigs that I run, if the fish are suspended, I'm going to troll for them. I can cover more water, and I'm also going to grab steelhead, brown trout, and Atlantic salmon. You know, in this time of year, they're exactly that. The vast majority of them are suspended. Um, I think that those fish, you can get them to commit better when they're on the bottom, whether they're on the bottom in 55 foot of water or 85 foot of water. It seems to be when you can get them to work down there and get them to chase. I, I offer such a vast amount of stuff, and a lot of captains and guides say I'm an insane because I do offer too many different things. I don't have the time to go out and experiment and say, okay, I'm going to try for suspended fish. But there's no question. I think when you've got bait on or uh, fish on the bottom, if I can stir the mud up with that jig a little bit, that's going to attract them to come over and see what, just what that presentation is. And when they see it leaving, you know, they're going to take off at it. Where if you're dropping it down vertically, Without Mega 360, with the right electronics, you could look down and say, oh, yeah, that fish is over here at 2 o'clock off the boat. Steer the motor that way and try and drop it down fairly close in their face and, and see if they're going to thump on it. But um, I won't lie to you that just about every way I've jigged for them has been when they're bottom, bottom oriented. So. Any other questions, guys? How long do you Usually four foot. Um, I've gone up to six foot. I tie an Albright knot um, with my fluorocarbon to braid. Seems to hold up for me. I used to dub around with a swivel. <laughs> you know, the swivel's nice because it does take that line twist out. And you do get a little line twist occasionally. It's not as big a deal as you are when you're trolling. <clears throat> for me, again, as a guide, people forget there's a swivel there and they crank them up in the tip of my guide to my rods and beat them up. So I, with this stuff, 
I pretty much run an all braid knot, just tying you know, the braid to fluorocarbon. With my trolling, I run barrel swivels on everything. On my, where I go from whatever my main line is down to my leader, which again is four to five feet, but I put a small fluorescent bead above that barrel swivel. So when they crank it up, they crank the bead towards the rod. They don't crank my swivel into the tips of my rods. Protects my rods, number one, but in stained water, that fluorescent bead is also a gauge. Okay, I see the bead pop up out of the water. Uh, I know my fish is now four or five feet from the boat if I can't see that fish yet. So I put that bead there. Any yeah. online questions? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, Kyle Wiley wants to know, do you ever tip jigs with live bait or add scent like cement, smell oil? Yep, scent, yes. Um, very rarely do I mess around with live stuff. Some guys do chum. You know, they'll take some chunk um, stuff. I've even heard of people buying shrimp and dumping them down there. And if I'm buying shrimp, it's going in my gullet, not the lake trouts. Uh, but yeah, smelly jelly, um, anise, um, smelt oil, any of those. Yeah, I, I definitely do use uh, any of those scents. Lake trout are big odor fish. So something they can smell, absolutely you know, tip it with some sort of odor. If you're not getting bit, many times it's a reaction bite, but uh, throwing some odor on there definitely helps out. No two ways about it. Any other questions, guys? I only got a couple slides left here before I go too much further. So again, as I said, uh, I got to thank some of the companies that I work with. I like to work with some of the more local companies. These guys are hard bait companies. I work with some of the soft plastic companies that you can actually find their baits right out here. Rabbit Baits is one of them. But uh, Daddy Mac Lure is out of Abington. And uh, my good friend Mike from Born to Fish, he's down near Cape Cod. Um, check them out online. They do have the jigs that you've seen me here with tonight. And they certainly catch fish. And uh, the other one that I work with is Christian Carlson out of Maine. He owns Northeast Troller. Primarily a spoon and flasher producer but he does some of my blade baits as well. Um, I will say from a trolling perspective, um, he is taking a corner on the market. Uh, there is a lot of captains on the East End of Lake Ontario using his baits now. And I've had phenomenal luck on Lake Champlain with his baits. So his, he does a, uh, a little bit better job of coating his spoons with uh, uh, protective gloss that doesn't seem to let the paint fall off as quick and the fish aren't chewing them up. So. Um, give his stuff a check. He's a taxidermist as well, but uh, Northeast Troller Gear, um, he's uh, got a lot of baits uh, over in the East End of Lake Ontario, a lot of shops out there, but you can buy all of his stuff online as well. And uh, his spoons have been very productive for me on Lake Champlain. And that is the end of my slideshow, guys. Any other questions at all? No, I have never tried it. I haven't either. You know, I think that, again, structure change is the key point. And everybody knows on East End of Lake Ontario, there is no structure change. It's very gradual. You know, so um, all of the structure I find in Lake Champlain that tend to be my best jigging spots is where you've got steep drop-offs associated with a bench that goes out into deep water. So if I've got an 85 or 95 foot flat and it's close to where it goes to 200 foot, Lake Trout are lazy. I can lay on that bench. And I can scoot out 150 yards and feed for an hour and go right back to my bench and lay down. So I think that that's my theory that most of my structure that I tend to find most of my lakers is associated with deep water. And again, right now, they're spread out on the shallower benches. So it's tougher to find them jigging. That virtually from 4th of July to September 15th, I have found when the densest, especially the biggest lakers, are really densed up on structure that's associates with deep water you know in champlain could be 250 to 350 i mean the deepest point is right north of where i troll uh, around split rock the essex ferry cross and there's 400 foot of water there but any of those benches on each side you're going to find lakers pretty close to that deep water yeah i i don't know if i've ever caught a laker below one 105 and i know guys that catch them 110 115 but again, those benches pretty much drop off at that point. You know, on the outer edge of it, you know, you're dropping into a buck 75 to 250 at that point. So those fish many times are hugging the outside of it. But I have found that when they're up on the shallower portion of that bench, 
and very rarely in July do I catch them under 75 foot either. That's, it's all temperature. Where is that prime high 40 to 50 degree water that they are very comfortable in? And with me, if I've been trolling for four days, I've got my probe down there and I'm looking for thermocline. I know how deep the thermocline is, but I'm already telling myself my probe looking for salmon and other species. Well, I bet my Lakers are going to be 95 to 100 now because they just want to be in that much cooler water. That's all. No different Ontario. I've, I've caught kings 140 feet down because the thermocline is already below 100 foot. You know, so in, in the summertime, kings want about the same as lake trout, 48, 50, 51 degrees. Fall comes and they're staged and they don't care. 55 to 58, even 60 degrees and kings will stay comfortable. So it's using that probe to tell you where that temperate water is that those species are comfortable depending on the time of year. So um, I've never targeted them. You know, I'm just moving back and forth. A lot of these shelves that I follow, literally follow the, the shoreline contour. If you watch the contour above water, the underwater is very similar to it. <laughs> so I'm following it up through and all of a sudden I see a bunch of fish, we'll hit the brakes, put the trolling motor out rip them for a couple of times, see if we get some follows and we'll go to another spot. You know, so, And what I found the days that I got to spend more traveling is when the bite is toughest. The days that the bite's good, I bet I hit three waypoints a day because it's that good that I bet I pull a dozen off in one spot before I go to another spot. You know, So it, it just really depends on what those fish are doing. And barometric pressure spells it all. You know, it took me a long time to realize that barometer affects things more, You know, especially when we've had non-stop you know changes in water and weather patterns <laughs> the last week has been the toughest this spring so a steady feed of northwest wind is not helping my issues right now <laughs> my water is moving all over the place so yeah. absolutely yeah yeah and 29.95 to 30.05 tends to be the best and then above that you'll see that you know it's going to be pretty thin but yeah falling if i can get 29.9 to right around 30 it's usually game on absolutely yeah yeah and and again a lot of it has to do with the mood and what those fish are doing i've tried jigging after september 15th 18th and boy i struggled to find a couple of fish here a couple of fish there no different than our kings doing lake ontario boy they're probably staging by august 15th and come the first couple of weeks of september you better be putting something chartreuse and stupid ugly in their face because they're going to bite nothing else yeah. yeah, yeah, they're usually schooled up pretty good, you know, by mid-August. Probably, and, you know, and again, I've only jigged for Lakers, Lake George through the ice. I've never done open water because I'm just too damn busy in my own water. But I'll guarantee that they're doing the same thing. You know, they're spawning the same time of year here that they're doing at Lake Champlain. So, you know, they're going to be schooled up on those deep water humps. And use your electronics and just keep moving around until you find some biters. And like I said, your first drop you get bit, you're probably going to stay in that spot for a while. If you got to work for them, you're going to work for them all day. That's, that's just what I found day in and day out of doing. Any more mm -hmm. online questions? Or? How would you suggest categories? Uh, fishing a lot of water fish. Yep. And, you know, you're trying to duplicate that. And what, is, what would you suggest to people that try to duplicate and find a lot of what I have found with Lake George and the jigging I've done is they want a little slimmer and smaller bait profile. Um, and again, I'm doing it ice fishing, so generally I'm fishing probably less than 40 foot of water when I come over and jig. But, um, you know, I think with a Smelt and Cisco bait profile, they're smaller nail wipes. So I'm going to scale down the jig I'm using, and your water here is pretty much gin clear. You know, it's, you don't have a lot of stain. And where I jig most of Champlain is fairly clear. Um, but where I run out of, as I said, with the Otter Creek, that's the biggest delta in the central lake region. It dumps a ton of nutrients and stained water into the lake. And you can almost follow that color change as it moves north towards Burlington. So I'm running a lot of whites and stuff. Here, probably a closer to, you know, a silver with a black top or a dark blue, something with that, you know, silver, maybe a light white on the belly of the jig. So it looks much closer to a, you know, a, a smaller uh, imitating, you know, that bait profile. And most, even from a Cisco to a, an Emerald Shiner or a Smelt, they got a silver side to them. It's what's the top of that bait look like. Is it got more green, more black, whatever. And <laughs> I'm finding it's a reaction strike more than trying to imitate what's, I mean, that blade bait right there. Tell me what that looks like in the lake. <laughs> Absolutely nothing, but they bite it. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's that vibration with that lure. They hear that, as that thing's going up. So they come right over and say, well, that's a minnow of some or food of some sort trying to escape. So, you know, I, I don't know is that all the time is it 100% about trying to imitate that exact bait that's there, but trying to entice them into something that they haven't seen before or entice them into strike on it all on their own. You know? Um, you know, with my trolling, I'll put a spread of eight rods out another couple of weeks once the thermocline sets up. I'll have four rods, bare spoons. The other four rods I'm going to have either dodgers or small pro trolls on. They, you know, they whip a lot more action to the spoon down there. I'll let the fish tell me. You know, if they're biting those flashers, I'm going to put more of them down there. If they, those don't move, I'm going to yank them, go to bear's boots. You know, and what, what are the fish telling me they want while they're down there? That's all. Every day is a little different, that's for sure. Yesterday, day before yesterday, if it wasn't copper and white, it didn't get bit. <laughs> I tried probably 15 different color variations. It was, a, for the most part, a cloudy day, but steady wind, so it wasn't glass calm. And in the central lake region, I was fishing around outside of Westport. Man, what had been working a week ago, I never moved a rod, but if it had copper with white, UV white on it, it got bit. So just keep trying to duplicate and hope you get enough lures that match up whenever that one's getting bit. You know, so it, it certainly varies from day to day. But it's a lot of fun. You know, and that's why I've kind of added into my forte um, because I get those people that are like, well, we're bored with trolling. We really don't want to troll. Okay, well, if the wind's not blowing mega 20, <laughs> We'll go out and try jigging, you know, and if the bite's good, they're like, oh my God, this is a riot. Oh, something different. It is. Yeah. Yep. Get water <laughs> yeah. yeah you're not, you're, you don't have to fight the fleas, which right. today was the first day I, one of my associate captains set up. Oh my God. The last two summers have been horrible on Champlain. And I prayed and prayed that we'd never see them in Champlain and they showed up. So yeah, they're there. They worse on Champlain now than all. Yeah, they're worse in Ontario. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yep. And a tail hook. Yep. They cling horrible. Oh yeah. Yep. I've gone to wire divers. Um, no, I used to run braid slide divers forever, and I'm using them right now. As soon as the fleas show up, braid's gone for the summer, and I go to my wire. You know, again, I got to do things to fire rods, and a lot of people aren't going to run wire in Champlain. I certainly get that, but for me, I got to be able to move rods around and fire fish, but. Uh, I've gone to 30 pound, my, my king rods, and I just dumb down the leader to eight or 10, 12 pound test. So I keep catching salmon, but the fleas don't stick to the 30. Pounds, so. yeah, it, takes it does. Yeah. Yeah. I won't, won't lie to you. But again, do I have fish that people can't crank up because they get six foot of fleas stacked on them versus actually being able to crank a fish in? You know? It's a, it's a double edged sword. And... No, I mean, <laughs> When the fleas have been real bad, you will even see them coming up on the brake because you are using brake. But they're just, you know, even with the fish swimming around, he's clinging a few fleas coming up. I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's absolutely nothing like trolling because it's not going to affect you cranking the fish in. But yeah, I've seen them stuck to the braid jigging come up through. So it is what it is. We're never going to change it. You can't get rid of them. But it doesn't seem to affect the fish here or Ontario. The fish are doing fine with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure. Sure. And it's you know lamprey control has been a huge thing for us, and you know U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Vermont Fish and Wildlife will tell you they'd like to hold at about a thirty percent hit rate, and I agree with that. That's you know, if I'm putting a dozen fish in the boat, three of them got probably lampreys on them coming in. So, you know, if we can hold at that, I'm a happy guy. I don't want to see 90% like it was when I was a kid in high school. But, you know, as long as we're keeping the lampreys down, those fish get a chance to grow and put some size on. You know, that's that's the key part. Do do water and its own because it can only spray in the fall. It has all to do with water. I mean, right now, this little rain we've got in the last two days, the first rain we've got since May 1st. Our brooks are down to July level right now. So they can only treat with certain water flows and they treat in September. They're, they are targeting those larval lamprey that were born in the last three weeks. So when they come up to that 
you know, two and a half to three inch size in the fall, that's what they're killing in that stream. But when they're putting TFM in the water, they got to have certain stream flows to do it. There's not enough. It's too toxic that it'll actually harm other fish species. If it's too much, it's been pouring rain, it's useless. You're wasting the chemicals. So you've got to have just the right stream flow to be able to treat that stream. And New York will be honest and tell you that because of the pandemic, they cut back just because they were pulling back on uh, man hours of people out working. And Lake Ontario, unfortunately, has proven that that was not a good thing. And I caught a lot of brown just spring and had lampreys on. Oh my God, they're covered. It wasn't with. just the man hours, also the, the chemicals made in Canada. Yeah, they couldn't, couldn't get it. Yeah, doesn't seem to have been an issue. Um, the I know that's some of the biggest I've ever seen. So. Oh my God! Yeah, I've caught them four foot long with their heads size of a half dollar. Hell yeah! Yeah, I mean, huge, huge ones in, in Ontario. I've never seen them like that in Champlain. So, yeah, hope not. And most of the ones I'm killing in Champlain are six to ten inches long and. Probably size of your thumb, you know, so hack their head off and back they go. The cormorants are our biggest problem. And anybody that follows me on social media, I posted a video today that I took yesterday coming down the Otter Creek and there's 300 of them swimming around my boat. And cormorants, the black the birds. Yeah. They're, they're eating all our, our fry in the springtime. All the stockfish say nothing about what they're doing to our smallmouth bass and, and yeah, perch populations. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Well, a, a little bit of good news, and one guy can't affect the world, but I was coming back from a trip one day last week. Wind had kicked up. We cut our trip short. Got the boat on the trailer, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife boat pulls in. So I go over and start chewing the crap with the guy, and so where are you headed? <clears throat> he was just out the sloop island. Can I get there? And he had a 19-footer, just a little smaller than my lung. I said, yeah, it'd be bumpy. You can get there. He goes, I'm going out to shoot cormorants. I'm like, you are? He goes, yeah. He says, they just allow me and the wardens to start shooting them. It's Strictly their people, you and I can't get a permit to go out and do it yet. The Canadians have opened up wide open. They're shooting them left and right up there. So, yeah. so they just won't be there. They're, they're still st That's just it. You chase them off one area and they just recongregate in another area. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. And, you know, soon as those, this isn't just a Northeast problem. Those fish all go to, or birds all go to Alabama and Louisiana in the wintertime, and they're a big issue down there. You know, the feds have got a, I know they're not listed as a waterfowl, but let's face it, they're a nuisance animal that has to be controlled of some sort, you know, so. Do, in due time, but our salmon fish in this spring was probably the best in Champlain that I've seen in the last eight years. So it, yeah, yeah, certainly has slowed down in the last week, but. Are you saying, you say by mid-summer, the salmon pretty much over with? Just go deeper, tougher to target, that's all. And I will always follow up that statement. In my last five years, probably three of the five years, my biggest salmon have come in July because I'm targeting lake trout and I'm putting lures down there and I'm catching six to eight pound salmon down there. Ooh. Trolling. <laughs> Trolling. Excuse me. Yep. Yep. Sure. Mike Terra Savage um, runs out of um, uh, Willsboro Bay. And he's on the on New York side. He runs a small boat, 21, 22 footer. So he does 95% jigging for bass, walleye, and, and lake trout. Um, last summer, I think I was still out in Ontario. So we've been close to Labor Day. He set a new lake record pending. I, I don't know if it's been certified yet. But the client caught a 14.3 landlocked salmon jigging for lake trout. It was a monster, just a beautiful, beautiful fish. Yeah. I did, beautiful kite, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous fish. Um, you know, we're not seeing, <laughs> if I could catch an Atlantic like that, you know, once a week, I'd never go after king salmon because they fight twice as hard as kings. Uh, but Vermont Fish and Wildlife <laughs> caught a lot of them in that eight to 12 pound range last year in the fall netting when they're, you know, catching them coming in to spawn. And when I say a lot, we're not talking thousands. You know, each spot was finding, you know, 10 or 15 a season that are good trophy fish. There you go. Yep. You know, in the spring that <clears throat> when they're condensed and, and this year seems to be those fish didn't 
really condense up down the south end by the bridge of Owaga area nearly as well as they do in other years. They seem to have stayed up closer to Town Farm and the Otter Creek Delta area. So I was out in Ontario on chasing brown trout most of the time that during that time period this year. And brown trout bite was the best it's been out there for a long time. So I stayed on it. Um, yeah, it was it was good. I limited every day. And we had some kings and cohos mixed in just about every day. So we were getting a nice mixed bag. What day was it uh, right before I came home? Would have been like the 26th or 27th of April. I got one 14 and a half pounds, 14.9. Uh, on 10 pound tests. Yeah, that's a monster. And thank God I had a guy that knew what he was doing on a rod because I pulled three quarters of the spread and just started circling that fish. And he goes, I'm out 475. I'm like, not a lot of backing left on that rod. <laughs> so we got the other two cookie cutters, part of a triple. We got the other two in quick and he really spent his time. And I fished the Oswego area, so, you know, we were in the flu of the Oswego. At that week, that Oswego was running like 18,000 CFS, so the amount of mud coming in the lake is great. It's got good color for those browns. But I couldn't tell you what that fish was. I was convinced it was a king until it was 30 feet from the boat. And then all of a sudden it rolled, and he looked at me at the same time. He goes, that was a square tail. I'm like, yep, monster brown, dude. Don't lose your shit. <laughs> he took his time, and we dipped the net under him. It's on the boat. No. Right before the spring lock, yeah. Uh, but he took it to fish where some flask guys, so it's going on the wall. It's going on with going on the uh, taxidermy bill, so added to the charter bill. <laughs> ah, fish of a lifetime. You know, I've never reeled one in that big, that's for sure. So, uh, I got one other question. Sure. Thinking about it for years, we were fishing Champion Shore. Certain areas along the coast line collections and reaches. Drop box, they're finding this massive stuff down there on the end. Uh -huh. It's massive. Uh -huh. What is it? Lakers. They're, they're Lakers yeah. mixed with bait. Yep. Are you kidding me? Nope, not at all. Every year that happens. Not just, you know, 100 feet. I'm talking about Oh, yeah. Yeah, we all see it. Once that thermocline establishes, those Lakers will set up, when the suspended fish will set up in that 85 to 100 foot column. And there's so many of them down there, it looks like a steady stream of fish, like a straight line of sonar. I see it all the time. It'll, it'll, if you're sonar, I think you'll see the you got it. Absolutely. Those are lake trout down there, all set up. Yeah. I've never tried jigging for them. And I, I guarantee you, if you set yourself up with your, I was going to say, if you, <laughs> when they're that dense, you probably got a shot at getting them to bite. And, I, and I, well, that's why I asked that question. Yeah, they got to eat. Exactly. And I'm, the other kicker with that is, I've thrown trolling gear down there and they can't get them to fire. But it's that correlation with bottom. If say it's mid July and just like you said, I'm going around in front of split rock and I'm seeing all those fish stacked at 90, 95, hundred foot over 250 foot of water. And they're all there. I'm putting rigs down there. I'm getting a couple of the fire at 75, 85, but those deep riggers hundred foot don't fire. I slide over to the Essex flat at an 85 foot of water. Put my baits four foot off the bottom and bang, 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 bang. I'll fire rods the whole way. Those fish are associated with structure are going to bite. Those suspended over deep water, you will struggle to get them to go down there. And so I don't know. Well, that's just it. The amount of food that's right there. You got it. Yep. There's so much bait. I think that, you know, yeah, that's. Yeah. With all that bait right there. With. Yep. And you can look many times, I'm convinced that, like I said, the biggest salmon of the year I always catch are in that summertime, and steelhead. We don't have a ton of steelhead in Champlain, but my biggest steelhead in the last five years all come in July. So I'm putting baits deeper. Those bigger fish, if you're seeing a school of bait, 75 to 100 down, if there's marks above it, you can almost bet there's salmon and steelhead. If there's marks under it, those are lake trout. You know, so trying to spread your baits, more important from a troller's perspective, know where my riggers are running associated with that bait versus where they are in the column. Because I'm nine times out of 10 gonna run my lures just above where I'm finding that bait down there. Because most time they're looking up, you know, so. And that's the difference. You talk to any of the captains and trollers, you know, we always follow the fish hawk and say, okay, thermocline's at 65 or 55 today. We're running all our rigs right in the thermocline. We aren't getting fired. Well, if you're seeing bait down 75 and there's marks around it, probably ought to dump a couple riggers down that deep because 
chances are those fish are staying on the food no matter what the temperature probe is telling you. You know, it's having a mixed bag. And once I fire two or three rods at a certain depth, then I adjust my dipsies to get into that same area. If I've got long lines that'll work, by that time in the summer, I usually run a 300 copper down the chute and I leave a drag just to like breathe on it and click out. So when the salmon grabs it, it'll start peeling line. Landlocks probably aren't going to pull a 300 copper off from a down or a planer board release like a king is on Lake Ontario. So very rarely am I running a 300 copper out on boards on Champlain. It just doesn't work. But I can put it down the chute and just summer before last, my biggest salmon of the season came on a 300 copper down the chute when I was Lake Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes you'll drag them around too. So, but we were trolling for Lakers and come across this bench, had to turn around. And just as I straightened the boat up, I think that 300 copper came up off the bottom a little bit. And that salmon was right on the drop off right there. Rod fired. I said to the clients, that's salmon. There ain't no lake trout running like that. And it was our biggest salmon of the season. Just, just touch over eight pounds. So. But you can tell just what those fish are going to do. Yeah, don't be afraid to experiment. That's, that's the biggest thing, man. <laughs> I'll throw I appreciate it. you answering that question. No, absolutely, because you're not alone. That's the one question for you. Yep, everybody sees it. And we, if we have to drop a regular dime, we're on the right to do that. Yep. Well, and, and again, the other key thing to think about, only because I think my brain, what do I do out Lake Ontario? 80 to 100 foot down is a normal day for kings. I'm running 14 pound sharks out there for those. I only run 10 to 12 pound weights on Champlain. So if I'm trying to drop down 90 to 100 foot, you've probably got six to eight foot of blowback. So you're still the height of this room above that bait, depending on how much cable you got out. So you got to let them out quite a bit more, depending on your weights of your riggers. You know? So. You just mentioned that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they track much different. Yeah. Are they worth the money they charge you? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> They're the most expensive downrigger way out there. But yeah, they definitely increase your fire. Yeah. Well, again, if I was fishing out there from now to mid August, I'd run sharks all the time. Yeah. You know, they're going to track the best. They track awesome. And they're going to keep you in that depth range that your brain's telling you. My rigger says it's down 105. I'm probably running right at 100 foot with a little four to five foot of blowback. Once you come staging season, take them off. Go back to a round ball or a pancake. Because I want a couple of riggers late trout fishing. My kings are going to be right on the bottom in 90 foot of water. And I'm going to dump a couple of flash of flies right on the bottom. <laughs> Pound them up. Pound them right in the face. So the sharks are useless at that point because they're going to hang on you. You're going to lose them. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you fish long enough, we've all donated a tackle. Believe me. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I got two packs from Sunny. And uh, yesterday didn't do much difference for me. The fish dropping that fast now but a week ago i was running you know a two or three ounce on a two color core and definitely makes a difference you know drop weights of different size drop weights depending on the time of year and what you're trying to adjust you know the other day i had four board rods out i had uh five color core two 150s or no a 150 copper and two two colors so the two colors are on the inside long rods are on the outside so the five color core is getting getting bit. I'm like, okay, how do I get that two color down to that same depth? Put a three ounce clip weight on there, and now I'm pretty close to where that five color is running. You can only have so many damn reels on the boat. You know, and how many things you're gonna have even as a charter captain? I, my God, I got 25 or 30 trolling rods. So if okay, I got two two colors. They're still too high in the column. The fish want to bite down here. That thing's riding up here. Put a three ounce drop weight on it, and I'm getting it down much closer to their puss and trying to get them to fire. So, oh yeah, yeah, you know, Sunny's work. Yep, I, I tell you, I did a little adjustment with his. If you buy a tackle shop out in New York, that's he's the big shark dealer, and he's actually a co owner now. They came up with a trolling weight system, and they're going to give you a, a clip. Um, doggone, I should remember the name of that clip, but they give you a split, a big split ring, like a key ring size split ring. And then you put your weight on there. Well, the problem is that weight twists the key ring with a lock on your line. So the weight's dragging this way. So I took a 50 pound spro swivel, put it through the key ring, then hooked the weight to it. Now it's on a ball bearing swivel. That weight tracks right nice and perfect in the water. Yeah. Look at it with the slurry and how that was going to track. It didn't look like it was going to track. No, it doesn't. No. So I just grabbed some of my big spro swivels, same ones we use on our flashers. 
took one of those, clipped it on there, put the weight on it. Now it tracks nice and true because that swivel can spin down there. They have a little adjustment to it. So they, they, they work. Two ways about it. I mean, I've got torpedoes and other companies that make drop weights that are 6 to 12 ounces. You know, like how much weight you want to put on there trying to get deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, so just keep toying around. So just connect your whole leaf to your typical wall. Well, in the springtime, I'm going to keep running until a 10 color stops firing. You know, so I'll, I'll run one board on each side generally every day. Right now, I've been running two boards on each side. So two long lines, three riggers, a couple of dipsy divers. Depending on how many clients I got on the boat in Champlain, we only run two rods per person. But um, once we're going below what a five or 10 color are going to hit, I'll probably run like a five or, or a seven or 10 color on one side and the opposite on the other side. And I also run some coppers, uh, 200 foot copper is going to get you 40 foot down, <clears throat> which is a touch deeper than a full core is going to, a 10 color is going to get you. Two and a half miles an hour, 10 color runs right around 35, 38 feet. It's not going to get you much deeper than that. So if those fish are running a little deeper, I'll go to a 200 copper. Anything more than that, then the drag on the boards for our lake is too much. It just then won't pop the release. I've run five and six hundred coppers on Lake Ontario, but total different animal with a fish the size of a king and a pop a rod that size. But as you said, even sometimes the five hundred copper, the king don't pull it off the release. You know he's on there, but he's dragging the board sideways. You got to snap him hard to get him to come off the release. You know. But snap it off and let him go. Yeah. So, but that either two fifty or three hundred copper, I've got two of each of those. And if we're fishing that deep, that's the only long line I can run. I run it right down the chute. And like I said, I leave that drag just so it's almost like a speed check for you. If I'm going too fast, you hear it start pulling drag. When I get it dialed just to the right speed, as soon as the fish hits it, it's going to bend that rod or they're gone. And gets a couple extra fish every day. You know, it's about putting numbers in the boat. So, but I'm usually done with the board by, you know, early July. I'm not using it much anymore at that point. But right now, it's... You're definitely still hitting it. I had three yesterday that came off the board, so it makes a difference. Well, I thank you guys very much. Like I said, if there's any questions, don't hesitate to call me, ask. I'm I'll share information with anybody. Thank you so much. Keep up the good photo work. Your photos are awesome, man. <clears throat>